Good morning or afternoon, depending upon your time zone. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar on the uh, introduction to flash chromatography. If you uh, have questions that come up during the uh, presentation, if you use the little chat box down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen uh, and type your questions in, then at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll go over those questions and see if we can answer them or uh, get you some information uh, in the future. What I'd like to do today is I'd like to just go over uh, an introduction, like, we, like I said, an introduction to flash chromatography. I'd like to go through the definition of flash, some similarities between flash and HPLC, also the differences between the two, the advantages of the two techniques, look at the difference differences in chromatographic phases that are available for the two, two techniques. And then I want to walk through how you would get started in, with flash chromatography. Flash chromatography is a purification technique. It was originally developed uh, back in uh, about 1978 by a, a professor by the name of Dr. Still. And it was really set up to replace open column chromatography. It was a very simple idea that he had really was when you look at it in retrospect and that was to simply apply pressure to the column reservoir to speed up the flow of mobile phase through an open column in doing the separation. Typically in all cases of flash the solvent uh, has been normal phase and the uh, media has been, the stationary media has been silica gel. That's been changing the last few years, but uh, up until the early, uh, about, the, about 2007, 2008, that was the traditional silica gel with a normal phase, mobile phase. If we look at the similarities between flash and HPLC, you'll see that most uh, other components are very similar. Uh, both have solvent reservoirs, obviously. Uh, both have a gradient former and a pump. And flash, just like HPLC, there's two choices depending upon the manufacturer of a flash system, whether they use uh, high pressure mixing, uh, where they use two pumps and mix the solvents together after the pump, or they do low pressure mixing and mix the solvents prior to a single pump. Both have some type of sample introduction valve to introduce sample into the flow stream. They both have separation columns where the separation is performed and that flows into a detector. And we can talk a little bit later about the different types of detectors available in flash and HPLC. After the detector, that's where the difference really occurs. HPLC, the detector signal is fed over to some type of integration package where the signal is integrated and quantitated. In flash chromatography, the fluid is fed over to a, typically to a fraction collector, and the detector signal is used to identify peaks and advance the fraction collector based upon uh, peak thresholds so that peaks can be separated into the different tubes in the fraction collector. Differences between flash and HPLC. In flash chromatography, it's really designed as a low pressure technique, typically less than 200 PSI. The columns are lower efficiency. The focus of flash is really as I mentioned earlier, on purification, but also on speed. The idea is, is to prep as much material as possible, purify it in a single run, and to make that run as fast as possible so that the compound of interest can be isolated and used in whatever the next phase of your experimentation is, you, is requiring it. As I mentioned also, typically flash chromatography uses silica with normal phase solvents. 
HPLC, on the other hand, is uh, a high pressure technique where pressures are greater than 1,000 PSI. You've probably heard a lot about UPLC, where they uh, have ultra high pressures, sometimes greater than 10 to 15,000 PSI. The columns are all high efficiency columns where there's uh, uh, very small particles, in some cases submicron particles, and very uh, small particle size distribution in the, in the columns. The focus is, instead of being on purification as speed, the focus is really on analysis and quantitation of what's in the mixture. Typically the flow rates are low flow and there's low sample loading so that you don't overload the column so that uh, you get good peak shape and, and also loading affects obviously resolution. HPLC is probably 90% done using modified silica such as a C18 and is really a reverse phase based technique today. Although it can be used in normal phase just like flash and at the same time flash can be used in reverse phase mode using C18 or some other bonded silica columns. The typical applications are flash is normal phase and HPLC is reverse phase. Obvious advantages to HPLC, well very high resolving power from the low uh, small particle diameter columns, information rich detector options, uh, especially with the uh, introduction several years ago of uh, mass spec in line with uh, the HPLC so that you can obtain a lot of information about your compound including um, compound identification. Also there's a broad range of stationary phase chemistries available uh, to modify selectivity and, Im and improve separations in, in many cases. Flash on the other hand has its own advantages and one of the obvious ones is the speed in purifying milligrams to grams of material. And we're talking about in a single run or, or two or three runs at the maximum to purify grams of up to grams of material. The other thing is is that typically you get purity of greater than 90 percent on a single pass in, in flash chromatography. And the other thing is uh, lower cost than when compared to HPLC. One point is the instrumentation itself or the hardware uh, is not as sophisticated as HPLC instrumentation. Uh, it doesn't have to withstand the high pressures, so therefore uh, lower cost uh, materials can be used in the manufacturing process. And so that, that certainly helps uh, lower the acquisition cost when compared to HPLC. Uh, the sample columns are really designed for high sample loading, uh, where milligrams and grams of material is loaded onto the column. Columns are also designed to be typically single-use columns, so therefore they're not in a large, uh, more expensive stainless steel housing, but they are in a polypropylene uh, tube that uh, is typically thrown away after, after a single use. Uh, and I'm just referring to silica at this point when you get into columns that are flash columns that are filled with C18 or reverse phase materials, obviously uh, the cost is higher and therefore those columns are intended to be used multiple times. And also there's been quite a bit of automation implemented into flash chromatography to minimize uh, the method development time and we'll talk about those a little bit later. The chromatographic phases between flash and, and HPLC are very similar. <coughs> I've tried to list these uh, fairly much in order of importance. Silica is the most commonly used uh, media in flash chromatography. C18 and amino are very close uh, in their popularity for flash. Diol, alumina, ion exchange columns such as strong and weak anion and cation exchange columns and cyano is probably the, uh, the least frequently used column in flash chromatography. In HPLC 
Reverse phase dominates the usage there. C18 by far the uh, most popular phase, however, for some applications such as uh, peptides specifically, uh, shorter chain materials such as C4 and C8 are available for HPLC. Ion exchange is popular, and then silica, diol, cyano, and amino. And an application that you don't normally see on flash chromatography, chiral, is uh, used a lot in HPLC and more frequently has been moving to supercritical fluid chromatography for chiral separations. I'd like to go through how you get started using flash chromatography. When we look at our new users that, that start using flash today, they typically come from one of two, two methods. They're using HPLC in most cases, and they're doing some TLC work, uh, typically to monitor reactions. Or they're doing purification on open columns uh, to, again, generally for uh, organic synthesis reactions or for purification of natural products where they have lots of material to purify. Uh, they use open columns to, uh, to do that purification. And so that's an ideal application f where flash can provide a tremendous benefit in the amount of th throughput and increased productivity. And then the last thing we're going to talk about today is the benefits of automated flash chromatography. If you're transitioning from TLC, probably most if not all of you are running TLC um, or have run it in the past. It's very simple. A sample is spotted onto the TLC plate. I can get my uh, cursor over here and you can see here where we've drawn a line on this TLC plate at the origin and we've spotted uh, three different samples in this example. The plate is then developed using a solvent system and uh, that has to be, the pl it's a fairly inexpensive apparatus. Uh, here we see uh, just a glass jar with a sealed, sealed cap that screws on. Uh, we have a solvent and the TLC plates in, in the solvent. <coughs> the biggest condition is that the solvent has to be, uh, level needs to be below where you've spotted the plates so that they're not just simply dissolved into the solvent. Solvent through capillary action migrates up the plate over time. And in this case, we see that we've drawn a line up here where the uh, from solvent front has migrated. And these two lines are important and I'll show you how, why they're important in just a minute. Generally, uh, these plates are silica. If you are doing a reverse phase flash, there are, uh, there are corresponding reverse phase TLC plates to help you uh, develop, uh, get an idea of what solvent systems to use uh, on your flash system by utilizing TLC as a, as a scout. So one of the things that's typically calculated in TLC is retention factor or RF. Retention factor is simply the distance the compound traveled or the compounds travel versus the distance the solvent traveled. And so here you see we have the origin marked. We have our solvent front indicated by this line. And so we're going to measure the distance between these two and in this example this is about 90 millimeters. We have our target compound that we've marked here and it has an RF or it's moved up about 28 millimeters while the solvents move 90. So the RF is simply the this division so this gives us an RF of 0.31 so it's moved about a third of the way up the plate in regards to the uh, solvent movement. And in this example you can also see a couple of impurities, one that travels pretty much with the solvent front and another one which is uh, traveling at about 0.8 or 0.9 RF. So it's traveling very, very rapidly up the, up the column, as well, up the TLC plate as well. <coughs> 
Well, to get from a TLC plate migration to uh, a flash chromatography, you have to transition between RF values and column volumes. So flash chromatography operates in column volumes. TLC plates are in RF values. And RF values are inversely proportional to the elution time from a column. So very simple translation where column volume is 1 over the RF or retention factor. And so in the example we had on the previous slide, we had an RF of 0.31 in column volumes that would translate into 3.2 column volumes. So that compound or target compound in the last example would elute at 3.2 column volumes in a flash system using isocratic conditions that are similar to what was used to develop the TLC plate. We'll talk a little bit later about how we can calculate the uh, column volume. Uh, typically on a, uh, uh, I would say that typically on a flash column that's uh, pre-packed from a manufacturer, it gives you the column volume in milliliters, but there's a way to calculate it in case that's not given, and, and I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Now, when developing either a TLC method or a flash chromatography method, one of the things that come into play is the, the wide choice of solvents that you have. And what this chart shows, this is a, a solvent selection chart, and it's based on solvent polarity. Let me just back up here. What this uh, indicates is there's solvents that are fall into eight different groups, and they are hydrogen acceptors, hydrogen donors, or just have a large dipole. And so you can see how they're grouped together. And then inside this group, for example, group one is isopropyl ether and ethyl ether. And you can see a value 2.4 and 2.9. The higher this uh, number, the stronger eluder that that material is. Now, as you can see, water has a value of 10.2. Uh, water is a very strong, very polar material uh, solvent. And so it's going to elute very rapid. Have move samples through a silica column very rapidly versus uh, one of the ethers, which is down at 2.4, 2.9. What it also indicates is, like, let's take group two here as an example. And in group two, you'll see where there's a series of alcohols. They all have roughly a very similar elution power, except for methanol, which is a much stronger eluter. But as long as you stick with group two, you can change the elution time by changing from one of those alcohols to another alcohol with a stronger value. However, to affect the separation or the selectivity of the mobile phase for your particular compound, you really need to move from one group to another group for your, for your stronger modifier. So uh, by using... Uh, butanol or propanol, uh, you won't get much difference in selectivity. You'll get some shift in, in elution time. But however, moving down to like a tetrahydrofuran will give you an increased selectivity over propanol, or a different selectivity, I should say, over propanol. Uh, however, the retention times would be pretty similar because their uh, elution values are, are very similar. Just a quick example of this. This is an example of uh, a compound where we're running hexane ethyl acetate, 50% of each. And you can see how the two peaks are very close together. And if you look at hexane, it has essentially no elution solvent strength. So ethyl acetate is 0.8. And if I substitute ethyl acetate for dichloromethane, which is 0.4, but then I double the concentration of that, I essentially have the same uh, solvent strength. However, you can see how these two compounds uh, have much different selectivity. 
even though their retention time for the top one is about the same. And if I would go back, you would find that ethyl acetate is in one group. If I can find it on this chart, it's in group six, whereas dichloromethane or methylene chloride is in group five. So you can see that just going from group one or from group five to group six for your organic modifier can change the selectivity significantly, even though the retention times or, or RF values in the case of TLC stays pretty close to the same. Well, when working with optimizing flash conditions, moving from the TLC data, you really uh, can't predict what the resolution on a flash system is going to be uh, from the TLC. You have to talk about delta CVs or delta column volumes. And that can be determined by this equation here where you take the retention factor of peak 1 minus the inverse of the retention factor of peak 1 minus the reverse of the the re inverse of the retention factor for peak 2. And by calculating this delta CV, you can, it's a much better predictor for how your compound's going to separate on your columns. Series of examples that shows this. Here's a mixture of A and B run under three different uh, conditions. And you can see here where you have an RF of 0.5 versus 0.4, or a delta of RF of 0.12, or a delta CV of 0.6. And you can see here where the separation is fairly close together, the two components of interest. Here we have an RF of 0.3 versus 0.2, a delta CV of 1.6. Even though the delta RFs don't change very much, we have a very significant separation. And here fairly extreme example where you have very low RF values, a delta RF which is even lower, poorer separation than we had on the TLCs here. However, we have a larger delta CV. And the real goal here is to maximize the delta CV um, in our flash system. So, factors to consider when calculating sample load because after all our goal is to load as much material as possible on on the column to make one purification run and so the resolution that we calculated on the from the TLC plates it actually plays a significant role in calculating what that sample load can be it really establishes a rule of thumb for what the mass ratio, which is the amount of compound I can load on the number of grams of silica that I can load it on. A third factor to consider is the required purity. And these three considerations here actually will determine the column size that I would prefer to use to make a single injection and purify the amount of material that, that I want to, to purify in a single run. Just as an example, this is a, a guideline that we use where we have an easy separation where delta CVs could be up to uh, 6 or we could load 10%. So in other words, if I have a 4 gram column, a uh, 4 gram flash column, I could load up to 440, 400 milligrams of sample and make one run of 400 milligrams of sample to do my purification. If I have a delta CV of less than one, then I have to cut my loading down to about 1% load and I can only load 40 milligrams of sample onto a four gram sample to get the same purification. So you can see here as the column size goes up, sample loading amounts go up, and you can see that 30 grams of material at 1% um, with, with a 1% loading, a difficult separation, 
you can it takes a three kilo column, whereas a 200 gram column could separate the, an equivalent amount of material if you have a large delta CV between uh, the target compound and the impurities. Another way to that a lot of our users approach flash chromatography is transitioning from open column chromatography. It's a fairly simple technique as to how to get from open column chromatography results to flash chromatography. One thing to do is what you really have to calculate here is you have to calculate, simply have to calculate the column volume of the, of the dry or the open column that you're using. So to do that, you get the weight of the dry column that you use to pack an open column. And so we're going to uh, weigh out the, put the silica in the, uh, in the column tube, and we're going to weigh how much material we placed in the tube. Now, if you slurry pack your columns, what you really want to use in this case is a non-volatile solvent, solvent if you're doing, uh, you want to, actually, you want to use a non-volatile solvent to reduce evaporation if you're slurry packing. If you're dry packing, you want to wet the material with a non-volatile solvent after you pack it because what we want to do is we want to determine the volume of liquid that's contained in the column. Obviously, you're all aware that when you pack a, a column like this, there's a space that's around the particles uh, that's filled with air initially. And that's the column volume space. That's the amount, the, the volume of liquid that can be, can be used to fill those open spaces where the particles touch one another but uh, don't don't completely fill in all the gaps. So the first thing to do is after you've got your column wetted is to drain the column down to where it's uh, the liquid is at the top of the silica bed and then collect in an empty container. You want to completely drain the column and then you either weigh or use a volumetric flask to determine how much volume of liquid was contained in the tube and that's the that's one that equals one column volume for that weight of silica now if you've weighed out a hundred grams of silica and determined that it has a 50 milliliter column volume let's say then it's proportional so if you have a column that's a, a kilo in size or uses a kilo of silica, then you're going to have 10 times the amount of column volume, or so or a column volume of 500 milliliters. So you don't have to, if you pack really large columns, I know some of the natural products people pack columns that are three kilos in size, you don't have to go through and use three kilos of silica gel to determine what the column volume is. If you just do it on a, a smaller scale, uh, that that scales up as long as you use the same uh, silica material because as you change from one silica material to another group of silica material you'll find that the uh, that the volume changes depending upon the manufacturer and the particle size as to what the column volume uh, is for the column. Last topic I'd like to talk about are the benefits of automated flash systems. First step is most flash systems have a, a gradient optimizer. And what that is is really a way to uh, automatically translate from TLC data over to uh, a gradient that the uh, that the flash system will calculate as a recommended or an optimized gradient to separate your target compound from your impurities. Now, if you look at this, we've run two TLC plates where we have 50% B in the first one and we have 30% B in the second one. We've marked our origin, we've marked the solvent front, and we've calculated our Refract, retention factors for 
uh, the two peaks of interest that are on the TLC plate. And you'll see 0 0.48, 0 0.4, 0 0.34, and 0.21. Uh, the retention is greater here. They haven't moved as far up the plate because uh, we've used 30% of our uh, of our stronger eluder solvent versus 50 percent. In the case of the uh, Teledyne ESCO system uh, and some of the other systems have very similar the screens that come up so it simply tells you here on the gradient optimizer you run two TLC plates and you put in the conditions for those two TLC plates as a percentage of B load in your target and impurity data from your TLC plates and as soon as you click OK it will calculate the optimum gradient conditions and program the uh, flash instrument to run those gradient conditions. I want to go through an example of the benefits of automation. This is a, a sample that we had a few years ago from a customer. Ran a TLC plate with 30% ethyl acetate and heptane. If two, um, two um, amid compounds here that they want to separate where they're fairly close in structure, the major difference is this uh, benzene ring here versus uh, two methyl groups. So what we want to do is we can see that we've the reaction has generated both of these compounds and this is the organic reaction mix. What we want to do is look at the first thing we did was simulate an open column purification and the goal is obviously to achieve 100 percent purity of both compounds. In all examples that in this run we used a, a 12 gram silica column and here you can see where we ran 30 percent isocratic ethyl acetate in heptane and then 25 and 20 percent. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the fact that when you did a TLC of the various fractions that were collected you can see where we have some of, of mixtures of compounds here when we moved to 25 percent we only had one fraction that where we had crossover where we had a mixture and at 20 percent there was one fraction where uh, neither the early eluding or the late eluding compound uh, was collected this was a total of 22 fractions across the across the plate but we were able to reach uh, achieve a uh, purity of 100% for both of the two compounds that we were separating. And so you can see here that we had three pure fractions, three impure and four pure fractions, five, one, and five, and 11 and 11. Many times uh, people talk about using step gradients and step gradients can be programmed into a flash system. And in this particular case we built a step gradient where we went from 10% ethyl acetate to 20% to 25% to 30% over a 20 minute time span. And if you spot the TLCs that we collected, we collected 15 fractions and we got excellent purification however there's two or three fractions that were collected here in the middle where neither compound was was collected so we're really wasting this solvent at this point point. and the last thing was we went through the gradient optimization we found the gradient conditions where we'd start out at 10 percent ethyl acetate and run up to 30 percent in a linear gradient over 20 minutes and you can see here that we found we lowered it to 16 fractions there's no fraction where there's no uh, 
no compound in it, and there's no impure fractions that we generated. So a 20-minute uh, separation here. Probably the biggest thing is in not only in the time. So it took 22 minutes using the gradient. It took 28 minutes using uh, the step gradient method. It took 30 minutes using the isocratic purification. So uh, we save time by using the optimized gradient conditions. The other thing we did was we save solvent. The optimized gradient generated uh, 660 milliliters of solvent. Isocratic separation required 900 milliliters of solvent. So we save time, we save money, and the fact that it takes us uh, less solvent, so our solvent costs are lower. Our di disposal of spent solvent uh, costs go down. And when you start looking at the time that it takes to evaporate these samples down to remove this solvent, the smaller amount of solvent, the better. So you save, again, time, which isn't even taken into consideration in the purification step. So now for the commercial, uh, just to go through, this is our uh, Combi Flash RF family. We have a, the Combi Flash RF 75, which has a flow rate of, of uh, of 100 mils per minute, the Combi Flash RF 200, which has a flow rate up to 200 mils per minute and 200 psi maximum pressure. And there's three different versions of that. There's simply with a UV from 200 to 400 nanometers, the UV Viz 200 to 800 nanometers, and then the RF 200i, which has an integrated ELSD detector or evaporative light scattering detector where uh, for detecting compounds where they have no or small uh, UV absorbance. In the table where we talked about the size of the columns uh, and a three kilo column, this is a, a photo of this is a three kilo column on our Combi Flash Torrent. It's designed for high throughput. It has a flow rate of uh, up to one liter per minute, 100 PSI maximum, and uh, with the 10% loading, you're able to get uh, 300 grams of purification in a single single run. This column over here on the left-hand side of the unit is what we call a sample load cartridge, and typically the way samples are loaded onto flash is one of two ways, either a liquid load where the liquid is applied directly to the to the column or in a solid load where the sample is applied onto uh, silica that's in a separate container. In this case, this is a reloadable uh, cartridge that can be used to load, load material. Um, and all of our systems are compatible with remote control through, through iPod Touch, iPhone, or iPad so that you can monitor the uh, chromatographic separation as it is ongoing uh, remotely from somewhere else in the facility as long as you have a wireless uh, connection network connection to your system and to your to your uh, iPad or iPhone and at the same time you can also change uh, your gradient conditions uh, remotely without going back to the lab. You can see all of the uh, status messages that might occur uh, so that you can react to those. Uh, you can uh, stop your run, you can pause your run, you can rewind it so that the system re-equilibrates for ready for the next run for when you do get back to the lab. So it maximizes some of your efficiency while you're not in physically in the lab. Again, I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, there is a, uh, a free flash guide uh, that's uh, available on the website at www.isco.com slash flash guide. Uh, feel free to go on and, and request your copy, and we'll be happy to mail it to you.
Uh, my contact information is there. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to call me or email me and I'll see if we can answer those. And lastly, uh, we will have some upcoming uh, flash, uh, additional flash chromatography webinars, uh, one that's focused on sample loading techniques. Uh, we'll talk about purification of compound classes and we'll talk about uh, beyond silica or some of the alternative media that's present. Again, thank you very much for your time and have a great day.